So it's a pleasure to uh, to be with everyone uh, this evening, and I want to just begin with a, a confession. Um, you know, this uh, course was obviously planned uh, before the events of uh, of October seventh, and uh, ever since October seventh, I've I've found it very difficult to think about anything but uh, but Israel. Um, my heart, my mind, kind of everything just just comes back to Israel, and I kept sitting down to read a tshuva and look at a dissertation and read a biography and and it it, it i just confess it was uh it was very hard um because that's just not um where where i was on any uh on any level so i'm going to deviate from you know really what i had uh, uh intended to do in this course um and uh, what I what I'd like to share with you is just a little bit of historical background about a few of the fascinating people from Ashkenazic Jewish history. Um, and then in each case, um, just because I can't help it, um, circle back to uh, circle back to Israel. Um, so I want to begin with the character of uh, Verbi Kiveger. You know, most of the individuals that we'll look at um, didn't live. In Israel, they didn't live anywhere near Israel. Most of them never, never visited Israel. Uh, but that being said, um, Israel played a prominent role in one way or another in the lives of many of the figures that uh, that we look at uh, together. So let me just say a couple words of introduction about uh, about Ashkenaz. Then I want to take you through a brief biography of Rabbi Kiva Eger. And then I want to share with you just uh, three, four, maybe five sources that uh, I think are actually relevant to this uh, to this moment, um, as we'll uh, as we'll see. Okay, so just a word about uh, a word about Ashkenaz. Um, they say in the mid seventeenth century uh, there was still more Sephardim in the world than uh, than Ashkenazim, and by the middle of the eighteenth century. Uh, where we'll start of begin, uh, Ashkenazim outnumbered Sephardim, you know, roughly three to two. So we don't have perfect statistics on these things. It's just uh, it's just an estimate. But just to kind of keep in mind in the, in the back of our heads that there are, there's more than two, you know, but, uh, but largely speaking, there are kind of two worlds, the worlds of Ashkenaz and the world of Sfarad. We've talked about this question in the past, but uh, it's an open question, and there's not a not a single answer, and I don't want to dwell on it, but we should at least know the question, which is to say, what makes us Ashkenazic? And forgive me if there's people here who are uh, not uh, not Ashkenazic, but what what makes a person uh, Ashkenazic? Anyone want to jump in and venture a suggestion or a, a potential answer to this question? And I guarantee there's there's really no wrong answer. So th there, there are a number of answers suggested by uh, historians and scholars over the course of uh, over the course of time. Um, you know, one possibility, and this was really the the answer of uh, Rabbi Yosef Karo, who uh, understood both worlds and was sort of the father of present day Sephardic halacha. Um, he said it was really based on geography. If you lived in a particular land, so you had an Ashkenazic tradition, um, but it wasn't inviolate, which is to say, if you left that place and moved to a Sephardic land, that would mean you would be absorbed by the Sephardic tradition and vice versa. Okay, So one possibility is that geography dictates whether and to what extent a person can consider him or herself Ashkenazic. Another possibility, and this is perhaps more intuitive, is there something about biology? So if my parents were Ashkenazic and their parents were Ashkenazic, so I have Ashkenazic genes, so to speak, and that makes me, that makes me uh, Ashkenazic. We can sort of trace our common ancestry really to the Bali Tosifos, to the, to the Tosifists in the 11th, 12th century in France, you know, present day France and Germany in the, uh, in the Rhineland and the descendants of the Tosifists and their traditions um, are Ashkenazim. There's another position which says uh, what really unifies Ashkenazic lands. And again, depending on time and place, you might be talking about uh, Poland, you might be talking about uh, Germany, you might be talking about Prussia, you might be talking about Russia. Right? So what really unifies the Ashkenazic world is language. 
and really for the better part of uh, this uh, period of seven, eight, nine hundred years, um, there was kind of a, whatever you want to call it, a Judeo-German, a Yiddish, a language that belonged to this group of people known as Ashkenazim that unified them across time and across uh, and across place. Okay. So uh, again, we may return to this uh, to this discussion, but just to note up front that there's not a single answer to this question. And someone says, I'm Ashkenazic. Well, why? And the answer may not be as clear as uh, as we may uh, as we may know. Okay. So uh, again, I don't want to um, uh, dwell too much on this uh, question. I think we all have a sense of the distinctions and the differences between the Ashkenazic tradition and the Spartic tradition. Um, it's halachic, it's uh, liturgical, um, it uh, it touches on questions of, uh, as we said, language and custom and uh, practice. Um, it cuts across uh, socioeconomics, sociology, right? There's really no axis uh, along which this uh, this question is not relevant, right? These two worlds are so uh, are so different in so many uh, in so many ways. The last thing I'll say is that around the time period that we're going to be looking at, let's say 18th and 19th century, um, the world begins to get smaller, and uh, because there are so many dislocations, you know, think about the Chmelnitsky massacres in the in the 17th uh, in the 7th century just by way of example you have uh, tons and tons um which is to say thousands and thousands of refugees um who are moving great distances in kind of all all directions right beginning with let's say take it back to the spanish expulsion at the end of the 15th century and then thinking about 16th 17th 18th century all kinds of other um, relocations among large groups of uh, large groups of people. So you have communities where, for the first time, in maybe ever, you have Ashkenazic and Sephardic um, Jewish communities living side by side, sometimes within the same city, right? And it's very jarring because you know no one had been accustomed to this uh, kind of confluence of uh, of worlds, and sometimes it made for fascinating questions, and sometimes it made for uh, friction. And everyone's trying to preserve their traditions and who's the majority and who has authority. And these are all fascinating questions which come up um, all the time, but really for the first time in many cases in this uh, time period that we'll be uh, that we'll be looking at. So I, I, I want to begin with um, uh, Rabbi Akiva Eger, not for any specific reason, not because he begins a particular you know epoch or because uh, he's the singular most important representation of, of Ashkenaz none of those uh, none of those are true um, but he's a figure that we've not looked at uh, in the past um he's uh, uh prolific which means that there's a lot of texts to uh, uh to choose from and to chew on um he has a lot of influence both during his time and for uh posterity um uh, and as we'll see uh he has this Humanity, which uh, um, you know, sets him apart from a number of uh, his contemporaries and other uh, and other figures, and makes him kind of very uh, very attractive. So, who is uh, who is Rabbi Kiva Eger? Rabbi Kiva Eger was born in 1761 um, in Eisenstadt and uh, was educated in uh, in Breslau under the tutelage of uh, of an uncle. And he was uh, you know well well-known and appreciated even as a young age as a budding, uh, as a budding uh, scholar. Okay, and what happened to, uh, to budding scholars is it allowed them, because they would be supported by uh, their future fathers-in-law, it allowed them to marry very young. And in fact, um, that's often a telltale sign. If somebody marries young, it's either because they can afford it or because um, somebody made it possible, which is to say their father-in-law. And uh, Rabbi Kiva Eger marries at the age of 18. He marries the daughter of a man called Rabbi Isaac Margolis of uh, Lisa. Okay. And it, as it turns out, Rabbi Isaac Margolis of Lisa um, is a very prominent uh, leader in his community and a wealthy uh, business, uh, business person. And uh, he supports his uh, son-in-law, um, for the first years of his uh, of his marriage and young uh, and young adulthood, seventeen ninety one, in seventeen ninety one, Akiva Eger is thirty, 
and uh, there's a terrible fire that destroys the better part of the Lisa uh, Jewish community. Um, his uh, his home is destroyed. His father-in-law's business is destroyed, and uh, the the funds run out. So now Rabbi Kiva Eger has to uh, make his own way in the world, and he has to support his family. So he turns to the uh, professional uh, professional rabbinate um, at uh, at at great personal uh, great personal costs. He writes um, a number of times, very pointedly, over the course of his rabbinic career, like he hates the rabbinate. He hates everything about it. There's not any time to uh, uh, to learn and to teach. He's always being pulled in a thousand different directions. The, the, this, every reason you could imagine why someone would despise, you know, the public uh, the public rabbinate. Sir so Kiever says, you know, I have to do it because I have to support my family. But you know, if I could be doing anything else in the world, I would prefer to be doing anything else in the world. That being said, um, he earns a, a renown as a prominent a rabbinic figure. Um, from 1791 to 1850 uh, to 1815, he's the rabbi of uh, of a town of a Jewish community called Merkish uh, Friedland, which is in present day uh, uh, Poland. Um, he was widowed at a young age. His his wife died in 1797 when he was just uh, when he was just 36, and we have a number of very kind of uh, touching and uh, poetic um, excerpts from letters that he wrote where, you know, he he, he despaired of the, the loss of his wife, who uh, who was such a, an instrumental part of his of his life. And I would say even of his of his being 1815, um, he becomes the chief rabbi of uh, Poznan, which is in, again, present day uh, Poland, I believe. Um, I have to check the map, but certainly at the time it was uh, it was in eastern, you know, Prussia, um, and uh, Poznan was a very prominent uh, Jewish community in the nineteenth uh, in the nineteenth century, um, and uh, as we'll see, also at the beginning of the nineteenth century, Poznan was a kind of hotbed of the uh, East European Jewish Enlightenment. Okay, which becomes a very important topic of conversation for the likes of Rabbi Kiva Eger, who's uh, an arch traditionalist, what would later become known as uh, as uh, Orthodox. Um, he also, uh, around this time, um, becomes the father-in-law of the Chassam Sofer. And it's a different topic, and we'll talk about the Chassam Sofer another uh, another time. Rabbi Moshe Sofer, um, who's you know kind of the father of um, Hungarian Jewry and sort of the grandfather of maybe present day uh, Haredi uh, Jewry, certainly anyone who descends from uh, Hungarian uh, stock, you know, looks to the Chassim Sofer as a, as a voice of, uh, of authority. The Chassim, this is fascinating, just sort of historical footnote, the Chassim Sofer and uh, Kibir were almost exactly the same age. They were, I think, maybe not even a year apart. Um, but it just so happens um, that uh, the Chassam Sofer's early life was uh, was tragic. He had a young wife who passed away, um, and uh, he didn't have any children. And um, by the time he remarried, he wanted to marry someone with whom he could have uh, could have children. He ended up marrying the daughter of Rabbi Kiva Eger, you know, who was much younger than uh, than him by you know generation basically. And uh, as a result, um, Rabbi Kiva Eger was the father-in-law of the of the Chassam Sofer, um, even though they were contemporaries and uh, and and colleagues. Okay, so another time we'll come back to the Chassam Sofer, who's a very important and fascinating rabbinic personality, an exact contemporary of Rabbi Kiva of Rabbi Kiva Eger. So I'll just say a word. Um, or two about uh, Rabbi Kiva Eger's uh, battles with the reform movement, and we'll look at one particular uh, letter, which will bring these, uh, which will bring these points uh, uh, home. Okay, so there was a moment. Uh, Rabbi Kiva Eger was uh, not just a scholar, but also a political activist. There was a moment when the Prussian government was reforming the educational uh, curriculum. And they wanted people to be uh, Prussian, and they wanted people to speak the language of the land, and they wanted to de-emphasize particularism and focus more on a kind of universalistic um, a curriculum. 
and they forbade a Talmud study in the uh, in the yeshivas. So Rabbi Kivega wrote a long memorandum to defend beautiful uh, defense of uh, uh, of Talmud, and he actually enlisted one of his students to translate all the statements by Gentiles about the contributions of Talmud to modern civilization and collect them in a special volume. Okay, so again, you think about this going on in the first uh, decades of the 19th century, just a kind of stunning political, you know, degree of political acumen to be able to kind of speak to the opposing authorities on their own terms. You think Talmud is uh, is backward and you think Talmud is irrelevant. I'll prove to you based on sources that you consider to be meaningful, Gentile sources, right, where, um, you know, Gentile uh, philosophers or wisdom seekers have excerpted particular uh, bits of, uh, of wisdom from the Talmud, right? I'll collect it all in a bomb and I'll prove to you in a, uh, you know, in a compelling, uh, in a compelling way that Talmud is actually, um, is actually a source of great uh, meaning and of great uh, wisdom. And we would do well to uh, preserve its, uh, preserve its study. And in fact, he won the argument, right? Which is uh, again, kind of stunning, uh, stunning to think about from historical perspective, but the government rescinded uh, rescinded the uh, uh, the order. Okay, all the while, Rabbi Akiva Eger was the uh, the head of a large uh, yeshiva in uh, in Poznan. Um, toward the end of his life, he was uh, offered the prestigious position to be the rabbi of Vilna, um, and again, that was uh, that would have been a major uh, that would have been a major uh, promotion. But Rikiva wasn't interested, right? He just wanted to. Um, kind of make ends meet and be able to do the things that uh, uh, that he did, um, and he declined the um, the Vilna the Vilna rabbit. Okay, there happens to be a historical source which um, which is fascinating, so I want to uh, share it with you. We don't have too many sources like this, um, but it so humanizes the uh, the person that we're that we're learning about um, that I wanted to uh, that I wanted to share it. Okay, so this is a recollection of someone who had an intimate knowledge of uh, Rabbi Kiva Eger's daily schedule. It, it's not dated, and again, this may have uh, this may have changed, but I presume it's from the time that he was the rabbi in, uh, in Poznan. Okay, so uh, here goes. You ready? This is source number one. If you have the source sheet, if not, I'm putting it up here on the screen. So um, let's just pick up from the paragraph um, that begins with the uh, the words, um, okay. Even though Rabbi Kiva Eger used to go to sleep around midnight, he used to wake up at four in the morning. And he spent two hours learning Mishnah. Fascinating. Six to seven, he gave a shear, like the pre shachris you know, early risers, like the Dafyomi. It's a uh, hundred years before Dafyomi, but uh, not a big shear. Just some of the community members would gather and he would teach Torah from six to seven. Hasha Sheva, Ad Shmona Litvia Shachris, he dove into the seven o'clock minion, and it took an hour. Ben Shmona Litesha, Achal Aruchas Boker Yachad in Bene Besosh, Osam Lora, Harkach Shuv, Meshach Kolayam Kula. I think this is an amazing line. So from eight to nine was breakfast. Big breakfast with his family. He used to eat breakfast with his family. Why? Because he wouldn't see them the rest of the day. Like, you know, people in 2023, family dinner, family breakfast. Okay. Family breakfast from uh from eight to uh from eight to nine. Aruha Saboker Haisam Rekevas Misafal Cafe Lilo Sukar. By the way, in case you want to know how he took his coffee, black, no sugar. Miteshad Esser from nine to ten. Uh, Tanakh, he used to study Tanakh. Also, you know, you think about uh, East European yeshivas and they're learning Gemara. If he started with Mishnah, he's learning Tanakh. Mieser ad achad asrei shir, 10 to 11 he gave a shir. Mishdei mesrei ad achas, and from 12 to 1, Chazra al ha-nilmad, he went back and uh, reviewed his his learning. Bimei achol, af pam losad liad shulchan aruch. Never had lunch at the at the table, 
Hamaraka Pashut Jos Achal Bitzraim Hugashlo Tzad Gemara Psucha. He used to just uh, sit next to his Gemara with a bowl of soup, and that was his lunch. Ben Ashaus Achas Ushtaim Achar Tzaraim Nach Ala Safa Mitzuyad Bi Paron Avar Ala Sfarim Achadashim Sheviulo. I'm entirely sure what that means, but somehow, uh, you know, they say Rabbi Young always oh, take an afternoon nap. So I know this wasn't quite an afternoon nap, but he would somehow park himself on a uh, on a, a chair, on a bench, on a sofa, and uh, he would have some kinds of writing implement, and he would go through any new books that were brought to him. Also fascinating to know that an important part of rabbinic responsibilities in the life of Rabbi Kiva Eger was sitting on a base din. So, you know, all kinds of issues come up uh, on a base din. It could be uh, financial disputes. It could be somebody needs to uh, get divorced, right? So whatever uh, issue needs to get uh, taken care of or adjudicated by a Jewish court. So that's what he spent his afternoons. Two to four, he sat on the base din. Bishuvo me yeshivo sanal shasa kosyayin. By the way, if you want to know what he did at four o'clock, he had a glass of wine. Umiyad Achrakach doesn't say red or white. Umiyad Achrakach yatsa lesavev nichlum cholim ubiker cholim belibui hashamash shel hachever kedishim. Okay, and now it's chesed, chesed hour. Four o'clock after a glass of wine. Maybe he would have had the glass of wine after. But four o'clock, he starts uh, making the rounds. So he's a community rabbi, he's a shtat rav. So what does that mean? It means there's people who have uh, uh, shiva homes and there's people sitting shiva and there's beaker cholim, there's people who are sick, there's people in the hospital. So you go around with the shamish from the Chaber Kedisha, um, again, whoever that uh, person was to uh, to assist him and maybe uh, help in you know very practical ways with people who were in need of help. This is like an editorial note. He says, you know, he didn't play favorites. You're rich, you're poor, you're, you're well-known, you're anonymous, doesn't matter. Whoever you are, if you needed a visit, Rabbi Kiva Eger visited you. Amanash yucha li'ispalga, last paragraph, li'ispalga la'stfila semincha b'tzfilin, hu kava osa tamid l'sha arba achar tzarayim. Okay, so he always dove in Mincha at four, and he always wore tefillin. Also, not the topic that uh, you necessarily would have guessed. Magen Avram is an important uh, 17th century uh, commentator of Abraham Gambiner, who wrote a commentary to the Shulchan Aruch, um, which appears on the side of the Shulchan Aruch in, uh, in Orachayim. So it sounds like, you know, the rabbi gets up between Mincha Marev and learns for a few minutes. So that was the learning between Mincha Marev, B'tzilas Marev, Shosei Yisbal Yachan, Yibbal Abat and Haile. HaKalil Tzamid Tzvila Laman HaCholim, and he always added a special Tzvila for Cholim, for uh, the people in the community in Nidah Refuah Shlema at, uh, at that time. HaShaw Shmona Ad Eser Be'erav, Huktash Lekriya Suksavim Mirtavim. Okay, he's not done, right? It's a long day. Eight to ten, eight to ten, he does correspondence. And so we'd answer email. So in all seriousness, right, he's not answering email. He's answering correspondence. So Shiles and Shubo. So people, right, he's a famous rabbi. People write to him locally and from um, far away, uh, far away places, um, either, uh, you know, junior rabbis or, uh, or colleagues. And they say, you know, we have this big question. Uh, you know, I'm a junior rabbi. I've only been doing this for, uh, for 20 years. And um, I'm not the biggest Talmud Chacham in the world. Here's the case that came to me. Uh, can you uh, can you help me? Um, what do you think is the psak? And you know, Rebbe, you tell me you tell me what to do. So from eight to ten, Rebbe Kiva Eger, you can imagine the and we have you know hundreds of them. Um, we don't have all of them, obviously, but uh, he kept a, he kept a copy. Wait, so he literally had to write out you know a copy or have a scribe uh, copy it. So one copy could be dispatched to the person who had written the question. Here's the answer, and another preserved for posterity. So we have a book called the Shilohs and Shubos of Rabbi Kiva Eger, here are the questions and answers um, that other people could uh, uh, could derive benefit from and learn from, you know, well beyond the orbit of the immediate uh, immediate correspondence. Okay, and then, you know, 10 to 12, he would learn uh, whatever it is that, uh, that he learned. Okay, so again, I think uh, kind of um, very intimate and, uh, and, and close 
uh, encounter with Rabbi Kiva Eger just to get a sense what does the day in the life of Rabbi Kiva Eger uh, look like? And you see someone who's devoted entirely to his community, um, you know, on all fronts. So he's learning and he's teaching and he's being a pastor and visiting and he's being a, a dayan and, and adjudicating and he's being a correspondent and answering uh, questions to far, the local and the global, right? And he's covering kind of all the uh, all the bases that one could uh, one could imagine in a, you know in a kind of very calculated and organized uh, organized way, you know whether and to what extent this was his daily schedule, you know always or just at one period of his life or he stuck to it as much as he could, but, you know if uh, if you're in the rabbinate long enough, so you know that you know schedules um, uh, are just uh, you know they exist in 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 theory and not as much in uh, practice you know, there's always an emergency and something always has to uh, something always has to get okay let me just pause there and ask if there are any uh, questions or comments and then I want to um, uh, share with you a couple of other uh, important sources yeah ear do you want to do you want to jump in you're muted. You're muted yet here if you want to. You are okay, I'm on. Go ahead, yeah. So I think I have never had a shear in Mugging Avram, but I think we have to understand something historically. This is before the Mishnah Vura. It's before the Arach HaShulchan. What was the major commentary that people would use for practical purposes at the time of Rabbi Kivega? And again, this may just be for the, you know, another, he's not teaching Shulchan Arach, but he wants to teach people what is the, I assume the Mugging Avram, in, Incorporates current minhagim that have come into play. For example, Mr. Brewer is filled with minhagim, and so the Yerach Hashulchan. So, you know, if you want to have a so practically, so he's giving a shear, it could be on a high level, and level, whatever it is, but basically he's saying, hey, guys, let's know how to keep Shabbos, let's know how to keep this, how to keep that. I don't know why the other competing texts were out there at the time that would have been used. Yeah, it's a great uh, it's a great point, and the Magen Avram uh, specifically, even more so than uh, his contemporaries, was uh, was very attached to uh, to Minhag and to Minhag Ashkenaz uh, specifically, and so yeah, it would have been a kind of natural go to text to um, to learn, you know, practical uh, practical halacha the way we would use, as you say very correctly, the Mishnah Brura, um, you know, in 20, uh, 20, 23, 200 years after uh, after Rabbi Kiva. As you may have noticed, he drank the wine after he adjudicated the court cases because you cannot right, right. <laughs> adjudicate the court cases under the influence of wine. So he delayed his wine till four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, that was the earliest uh, earliest opportunity. Okay, so let me just share with you um, two quick comments from a man called uh, Harold Lyman, um, and I always like to come back to these uh, to these texts because they have a deep Jewish center connection. Um, rabbi Leo Young, the second rabbi of the Jewish Center, served from 1922 to 1987, um, wrote dozens and dozens of books. Um, he also edited um, uh, like dozens of uh, dozens of books. A number of them um, were books of Jewish biographies. So one of them is called uh, is called Jewish Leaders, and there's a 20 page essay on Rabbi Kiva Eger. You could find like uh, you know in the sum total of these books, it's probably 50 or 100 biographies that were edited by Rabbi uh, by Rabbi Young. So just a couple of excerpts from this very nice uh, short article about Rabbi Kiva Eger in Jewish Leaders, out of print, but uh, we have a couple copies at the Jewish Center. So um, he wrote to his children um, who were publishing his response. Bikiva Eger's response were published like in many uh, great uh, Rabbanim. Uh, they were published posthumously by his children. So he just, he left a note. He says, no doubt you will find that many of those who wrote to me had studied in my yeshiva. Please do not refer to them as pupils, for I have never called a person a pupil. How indeed can one know who has learned more from whom? Please ignore also the flattering salutations and the letters addressed to me. I've always had the desire to stop this annoying practice. Therefore, please omit the adjectives. I despise them, and they can only serve to embarrass me in the world to come. Okay, so just two very important points about, uh, you know, response to literature. So first of all, he had hundreds of Talmudim over the course of his lifetime, but in this really beautiful display of humility, he says, I can't call someone my 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 student. I can't call someone my pupil. At the end of the day, I may have learned much more from them than they from me. And so there's a collegiality. Maybe I was their student, 
right? Point number one. And point number two, if you've ever learned, if you've ever studied uh, the response to literature, so you know that uh, everything begins with a whole paragraph of flowery language. You're the, the smartest, the wisest, the greatest, and a poem and an excerpt from Tanakh and a play on words and a pun just to demonstrate that you are the, why am I writing to you? Because there is nobody who could solve this problem. Like, so in Mickey Vegas, it's just, just skip it, right? It's in the letter. Uh, you know, I want to be faithful to the letter. So here are the letters, but just skip it. It's terrible and, right, it's not helping anyone. Just, uh, just let it be. The second point I want to just bring to your attention is this beautiful, uh, beautiful line where he says, often you will find that I've gone into lengthy discussions of theory, not directly concerned with the law. So he says, I got a question, and then I start to uh, meander intellectually, and, uh, you know, they just wanted to know what the Allah is, and I went back and forth, and I wrote three pages. He says, don't pay too much attention to that. Know that I was motivated by the knowledge that my correspondent was a man who had undergone many trials and much suffering. Therefore, I have lengthened my replies so that he may have greater pleasure and forget his troubles in the delight of the discussion. Right? And this is what I meant when I said there's so much uh, humanity beneath the uh, beneath the surface. It's so uh, it's so telling. He says, you know, I wasn't just writing the answer to a question in a cold vacuum in a laboratory. Th that's not what was happening here. It was a real person at the other end of this correspondence. And I'm telling you, in this particular case, the other end of the correspondence was a person who was suffering for whatever uh, for whatever reason. I'm not there. I'm writing from a long distance away. And if I could do something to alleviate his suffering because he'll enjoy my writing or he'll have an opportunity to learn something new or explore an idea that I share with him. So I'm trying to accomplish that, that end. You, my children who are publishing the thing, right? It, it, that's going to be lost. No one's going to know that, uh, you know, Mr. Goldstein, who I was writing to, right? They're just going to know the, the argument that I make in the halachic writing that, that you see in front of you. So just know, right, there's like an asterisk by this, uh, by the side of this, uh, this tshuva, this responsum. Don't be so uh, moved by the halachic argumentation. It's almost secondary, right, to the human, to the human desire to alleviate suffering that actually motivated my, uh, my response, right? I'm not really aware of, of another um, analog quite like this among you know authors of response uh, response literature, but it's such a window into the to the human quality of these uh, of these correspondence. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's quite telling and really quite uh, quite beautiful. Okay, what I want to do in the time that uh, we have remaining, as I mentioned at the beginning, is just share with you um, two or three sources that bear on uh, uh, that bear on Israel. Um, you know, again, Rabbi Kiva Eger didn't live in Israel. Um, he never visited Israel. Um, but th there are a couple places where he mentions uh, where he mentions Israel, and uh, and I think it's it's actually quite moving and quite uh, quite telling. The first um, instance that I want to uh, that I want to share with you comes from uh, a letter that's actually very important for. Um, uh, more immediate, uh, more immediate reasons in Rabbi Akiva Eger's um, uh, polemics against uh, the reformers. Okay, and as you know, there was a movement afoot to reform Judaism. So part of the early desires of the reformers was to reform the uh, the temple, reform the synagogue, and reform the liturgy. Right, those are kind of like the the front lines of the polemical battles between what would become reform and orthodox or the enlightenment and the traditionalists as the as the case uh, as the case may be so i want to share with you uh, i want to share with you a letter um, where uh, from 1819 where Akiva Eger kind of goes on the offensive and says why it's so important to preserve the uh, tfilos as uh, as we have them and why it's so important not to mess with really any jot and tittle of the uh, of the rabbinic tradition, and we'll see as a kind of footnote um, that I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, this uh, um, this preoccupation with um, with the Holy Land. Okay, so if you have it, it's source number five on your source sheet. I'll just pull it up here for a second. 
I mean, this was republished in a book that uh, it captured many of these polemics with something uh, referred to as the Hamburg uh, Temple Controversy in 1819. The book was called Ela Divri Habris. Um, the, the letter is published uh, in a couple places. I have it for you here, excerpted from a book um, of letters of Rabbi Kiva Eger. Okay. So he writes the following. He says, um, There's this new group of people that's interested in doing battle against the Talmudic tradition. And they've made up stuff, you know, of their own of their own minds. And they just kind of rewrote the sitter based on, uh, you know, whatever they thought was was right in the moment. He says, look what they do. They knocked out, you know, the brachos at the beginning of the service of shachris. They knocked out all of psukit zimra, right? Uh, they just uh, they just excised it. They just say a couple chapters of Tehillim. They don't even say ashray. The amazing line from the Talmud says anybody says Ashrei three times a day, so it's certain that they'll inherit a place in the world to come. They just knocked it out. Can't be. You can't do that. Megillah's express Mishnah in Megillah that says that at the end of uh, Torah reading on Shabbos you have to add a you have to add a maftir from the uh, from the Navi what we call the Haftarah they knocked out the whole Haftarah they don't even do it I, I mean I don't even know this word but now we know it's a word next paragraph he says ha hey hey exclamation point right like oi can't be like it's 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 terrible, right? You have to uh, you have to protest. We're risking we're risking the very foundations of our religion. If you go down this path, everything if you if you mess with the foundation, everything is going to crumble. What's amazing, right? Is this you couldn't know this in 1819. There was no there was no history, right? Uh, maybe I'm exaggerating a little, but let's just say, right, no reformed Jew in 1819 had ever intermarried. Again, I don't know if that's true, but certainly not 70%, right? So, it, you know, why were the reformers reforming? They were all well-intentioned. They saw the world was opening up and the, you know, ghetto walls were crumbling and young people were interested in uh, in the world and they were leaving uh, religion and they were leaving Judaism and now there were opportunities for them that didn't require them to keep tradition. So they started to bend and they started to, uh, you know, make accommodations, not for the sake of making accommodations, for the sake of keeping people in the fold. Right. They're, again, their intentions were 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 justified. But Rabbi Kiva Eger, right, presciently says, you know, look what will happen. And with uh, with uh, hindsight of the last uh, two hundred years, you could look what happened. Right. It's not a, a judgment, even though it is a judgment. Um, but uh, but you have now the empirical data that says, look what happens when you mess with the core. And you mess with the foundation, everything else starts to starts to crumble. So he says, He says, if you mess with even one one thousandth of rabbinic Judaism, you're done. Right. And again, it sounds so extreme. Like, really? Like, does it really matter if uh, you know you say Sukkot is Imra from the beginning to the end, or you shorten it? He says, yeah, it matters. It matters, right? We have a tradition. If you don't stick to the tradition, you're going to go down a path that's just not going to succeed. He says, I'll give you a couple of examples. So he says, if, if you start messing with the rabbinic tradition, you start messing with the rabbinic tradition, you would never know even how to put on tefillin because just following the Torah, you'd never know, right? That's an oral tradition. I mean, how would you know that there's four sections and four and four parshios? 
Munach um, b'makam she munach shaltina grofes v'lo bein ayin amayim. I'm sure it just says it does v'os bein echa. How'd you know? Maybe you'd put it on your nose because it just right. The pasuk says between your eyes. No, you need a rabbinic tradition to tell you that it goes in your. You wouldn't know any of that. There's no way you could possibly know it unless you have the rabbinic tradition. And on and on. Bishiyu munach b'makam she munach shalt. Okay. Umehech and yadu mehem malachas through b'shabbos. How would you ever know that uh, you're not allowed to do the thirty nine malachas on Shabbos? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say it in the text of the Torah. I mean, I yadu shad lachas ne'er b'li torach beginim klal bichlal malacha. This is dona b'skil. How'd you know? Do you just take a match and you light a candle? That doesn't. That's not malacha. That's not laborious. How would you know? That's pretty. You'd never know. Okay. So he goes on to say, um, you, you know, if you don't accept uh, the fact that the oral and written traditions, you know, are interdependent, so that makes you a heretic. And what what can you say? Right. And this is the offensive that uh, Rabbi Kiver goes on against the uh, uh, against the uh, against the reforms. Okay, so uh, I'll just uh, share with you the next paragraph. He says you have to keep the the language of the tefila, and they wanted to translate it and have certain tefilos in German and make it in the um, in the vernacular, so it would be more understandable. Because who understands Hebrew if you don't have a strong Jewish education? So, okay. And again, they're all resonant, right? We understand all of these kinds of debates, and Rabbi Akiva Eger wants to hold firm to the tradition. The other piece that Rabbi Kiva Eger rails against is the fact, and I think you know this, um, is that the early reformers knocked out all references in the tefillah to the return of the Jewish people to Zion. So Beis HaMikdash, knock it out. Korbanos, knock them out. Tzion, Yerushalayim, all, who needs Tzion, right? Like, uh, again, in Western Germany, so the motto was, we're not going back to Jerusalem. Berlin is Jerusalem. We have it all, right? We're our home. We don't need a homeland. It wasn't until, by the way, the 1950s, it wasn't until the 1950s that the reform movement came around and uh, embraced any notion of Zionism, right? Until then, right, for the first, whatever you want to call it, 150 years of reform Judaism, the, the, there was, right, again, Zionism, we could go back to political Zionism, say it started in 1897, but even, right, hundreds of years before, so the Orthodox, right, the traditionalists, so maybe you wouldn't call them Zionists, that'd be anachronistic, but we always said, you know, uh, Uval et Sion Goel, and we always said, we'd say, right, we're, we want to get back to the to the Beis Hamikdash, we want to get back to Zion, we want to get back to Jerusalem, so Rikiv Eger says, how could you not want to get back to Jerusalem, how could you knock that out of the out of the tefillos? And this is the paragraph that I, you know, thinking about in, in our moment. Gam He's writing this from Prussia, right? From Poznan. How could you not pray for the restoration of the temple? Okay, and, and again, this is really amazing to think about just to put in context. What did it mean to be living a pretty pretty decent, safe, secure Jewish life in the diaspora in the 19th century, okay? And there's a window here. So, you know, the Rabbi Kiva Eger um, has some, uh, you know, bouts of plague during a COVID. Everyone quoted the famous uh, letter he wrote about, uh, about, you know, what to do during a cholera epidemic. It's not for now, but that was Rabbi Kiva Eger. So it wasn't all, uh, you know, roses and, uh, and raindrops. There were challenges. But, um, you know, Rabbi Kiva Eger didn't have a pogrom in Poznan. He was doing pretty well. So he says, We're doing fine. It's quiet. It's safe. It's secure. And God has basically, you know, blessed us. There's, uh, this is a, a new period of, uh, of, of Jewish life, emancipation, political equality. I mean, who ever heard of such a thing? You're living at the beginning of the 19th century, right? Amazing to be a Jew living in Prussia in the 19th century where you could, you know, kind of, uh, you know, have a voice in civic civil society and maybe you could get a job without being discriminated against too much just because you're Jewish and, you know, you didn't have to walk around with some kind of special uh, clothing. It's pretty good. And 
Okay, and we have to uh, we have to dive in for the government. It should continue to be good. Right, we, there's a pretty good situation we got going here. Now here comes the but. Afal PK, nonetheless, right? You guys, you enlightened Jews, you you think you know uh, again? Poznan is the new Jerusalem, and we're good. Is no. We still pine every day. We daven every day for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Not because, you know, we hope that uh, land flowing with milk and honey, Jerusalem, you know, we're going to have it better than we have it in uh, in Prussia. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll. He says, I don't know. It doesn't matter. We want to get back to Jerusalem because... When we have a temple, we could bring korbanos, and we could have a close relationship with God. We have a temple, and 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 that's you know the opportunity to perform mitzvos and to live in the land and to perform the mitzvos of the of the land. An amazing line, he says, and kind of like what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If we get back to Jerusalem and we have a temple and we can bring Karbanos and we have a special relationship with the Jews, it's good for everyone, right? And this is, a, again, part of a much larger conversation, but against the notion of, you know, pure universalism, he says, I'm not opposed to universalism. I also want what's best for all the nations. But the way to get what's best for all the nations is to first embrace the particular, right? And do what Hashem wants, which is, right, the... Jewish people living in uh, in Israel being able to serve him the way we're able to. And when that happens, that's not just good for the Jewish people. It radiates out for, from there, and it's actually, uh, you know, redounds to the benefit of all people of the uh, of the world. Okay, so just a kind of really, uh, I think, uh, you know, an amazing uh, formulation um, of, uh, you know, someone living in relative safety and uh, and security in uh, Prussia, you know, 200, uh, 200 years ago, and then to kind of juxtapose that with our own, uh, with our own uh, movement, moment. I don't remember if it was uh, maybe uh, Bialik or there's some famous, you know, poet in uh, the 20th century, you know, said when I was growing up, uh, the graffiti on the wall used to say, you know, Jews, um, you know, go to uh, go to Palestine. You know, that's what the graffiti on the walls of uh, Eastern Europe said. He says, now I'm living in uh, in Israel, and the graffiti on the wall said, Jews, get out of Palestine, right? And there's this constant, you know, tension and constant conflict. Wherever we are, we're not at home, and they don't, and they don't want us, and we have to, uh, and we have to grapple with that. And sometimes there's a bubble, and they're okay with us, and the, they do want us, and it actually is comfortable, and it actually is sustainable. And then we have to step back and wonder... Right? Do we belong here? And the moment that we forget, you know, where we really belong is uh, is a very vulnerable uh, is a very vulnerable uh, a moment. And I was just thinking about this. We met with someone uh, last week who was, uh, you know, a victim of October seventh in the South, and she just said, she just said, you know, I feel like a refugee in my own uh, in my own land. It's a very powerful, you know, formulation. For two thousand years, we waited to get back to Israel to have safety and security. And then to be in Israel and not have safety and security. So, like, where are we at home? We're always pining. We're always dominating. We're always hoping. Rabbi Kiva Eger reminds us in 1819, right? You can't knock out these tefillos from the Siddur. You can't knock out these aspirations from the Jewish heart. We're always trying to get back to Zion. We're always trying to get back to uh, Yerushalayim. Let me close with one uh, with one final uh, with one final source. It's source number six on your uh, on your source sheets, and maybe in the interest of time, I'll just uh, I'll just put it up and maybe summarize it uh, for you. Um, this is actually a text that was written to Rabbi Akiva uh, Rabbi Akiva Eger. Okay, I mean, I'll just do like the first five lines and then I'll summarize the rest. He says. Um, Um, source number uh, source number six. Hadur atem ra'u bisbonu v'simu alev lishtatef b'tzaras achenu b'nei Yisrael gedolim anche shem hashoknin b'hartzion b'tzvas. This is uh, folks in in Prussia. We're trying to help out our brethren in Israel in Tzvat. 
in Sapphish. And with Zionim, the halacha, the base of Medrash, Hukvu, Menikra, Al Shmo, Shal Rabbeinu, Agadol, Agonim, for Sama Chasid, Moreno, Rav, Eliyahu, Vilna, Zatzal, Zuchuso, Yagen, Badeinu. They set up, I don't know exactly who it is, but, uh, you know, the Vilna Gon died in 18, uh, in 1797. So, uh, you know, in the next, uh, in those years, uh, the end of the 18th, the beginning of the 19th century, students of the Vilna Gon uh, emigrated to uh, to Israel and tried to uh, try to set up shop. You know, I just as a parenthesis, that's why um, certainly in Jerusalem and in many Ashkenazi communities in uh, in Israel, they, uh, they follow the Nusach Hagra, the, the tefillah follows the, the traditions of the Vilna Gon, the halacha follows the, the halacha of the Vilna Gon, because it was his students who, who were uh, so uh, foundational in setting up communities after his death at the, uh, the first half of the, uh, of the 19th century. So they have a base medrash set up in, uh, in Svat. They named it after the Vilna Gon, right? He just died 20 years ago. And, um, and the, you know, the community in Israel is always... It's just always, it's, it's just a uh, truism for hundreds of years, the destitute, right? There's malaria and there's plague and there's famine and no one can ever make ends meet, um, you know, until until the 20th century um, in uh, in Israel. So uh, the, the the idea was that they just, they just knew they couldn't make it and they were totally dependent on the, on the generosity of other Jews to be able to uh, to be able to subsist, right? So the kavu midrash v'yeshiva hachashuva rama v'niska v'hagdol torah l'adira, and they set up this base midrash, and it's wonderful and it's beautiful. Sham makom marbits the Torah, and from there Torah spreads and emanates. Minai rabbanu de pia shamayu minai mufagim biir Hashem, wonderful God for in people. Shab yidnu tzidkos Hashem v'lanim ba'omkim shalacha blishum esek shavulam ach ach le Hashem levadero. People just immersed in uh, in learning, and it's beautiful. Hema yoshvim tzor mitzukal lelehem shalim lulachem v'ayin, and they're struggling. They don't have any. V'anach yoshvim ba'aretz. There's a word missing wherever we are. You know, here in Prussia. V'lo zachinu lenashik afros kadosh, afros kodesh, and we're not there. We never had this chus to get to Israel. We never lived there. We never visited there. We're not there. And this is the line that I wanted to just share with you. It's so beautiful. He says, we can't be there. But if we support the people who are there, we have a chilek. We have a portion in everything they're doing. Chilek v'nachalai mahem. We have a portion in their Torah, and we have a portion of Maseyem, Hatovim, Behema, Yaginu, Baadenu, Vispalo, Lenu, Al Kvuros, Atadikim, Achi Kulanu, Niskel, and Achamas, Zion, Yushalayim, Umelach, Biafo, Tehazen, Ene. It's so beautiful. They say, you know, it's like this mutual reinforcement. We can't get there, but they're there, so we can support them. And then, uh, you know, by supporting them, so the Torah that they learn and the Masim Tovim, and they'll go to the Kivrei Tzadikim, you've been to Tzfat, you know, all the amazing people who are buried there, and they'll uh, be able to daven at the Kivrei Tzadikim, and they'll daven for us, and we'll, based on their Tzfilos, one day we'll get to return to Tzion, and we'll get back to Yerushalayim. And there's this beautiful mutuality, right? So the rest of the letter is, you know, the, the way that they uh, that they send Mishulachim, they used to send the, called the Shadar, like a shaliach to collect money from, um, you know, Jews who were able to uh, to support them in uh, in Europe. And, you know, the Shadars would return and uh, uh, allocate the money. Every community was called the Chalukah. They had some a portion of their tzedakah, which would just fund the indigent Jews of, uh, of Israel. And it was this mutual this mutuality um, that defined the uh, the relationship. So the letter, they say, you know, the system we have in place really isn't a great system. Sometimes the Shadar comes and, you know, we have a little more, we have a little less. Let's just organize it and standardize it. And we'll have a constant uh, collection for the Jews of Eretz Yisrael in each community. And we'll make like a quarterly you know, donation to we'll, every quarter, we'll send the money to uh, to Israel. So that way, you know, we'll have a standard amount that can be collected, can be distributed, and they won't have to worry that, you know, one season was uh, thinner and one was better. 
All right, we'll just uh, standardize the operation. Keith Ager says, you know, that's uh, that's wonderful. That's great. I, I support you. But this notion that, you know, the relationship between diaspora Jews and Israeli Jews, and again, there's no Israel in uh, 1819, but Jews living in what would become Israel. So they need each other, right? And there's this beautiful sense that the uh, diaspora Jews have a way in which they can support the Jews of, of Israel, and the Jews of Israel have a way in which they can support the Jews of the, of the diaspora. So I don't think I need to uh, uh, to spell it out, you know, more in this uh, in this moment. But that's certainly what uh, what we're all feeling, and we're all grasping uh, for ways because we're not we're not there, and uh, and and we feel the the pain, and we feel the anguish, and we feel the suffering of the Jews who are in Israel and who are on you know the literal and figurative front lines of this uh, of this terrible war. And uh, we recognize that uh, uh, you know we're we're totally um, we're totally enmeshed and we're totally intertwined and we're totally uh, interdependent. And uh, we wouldn't be the same people without the Jews of Israel, and the Jews of Israel wouldn't be the same people without the Jews of the diaspora. And again, we have this hope and aspiration that we'll all become Jews of Israel, right? At some point uh, in the near uh, in the near future, and uh, we hope that all the Jews of Israel will be able to live in peace and uh, security, you know, in the uh, in the near future. But it's this uh, this beautiful sense. Rabbi Kiva Eger and his correspondence uh, reminds us that there's this ongoing, you know, mutually beneficial relationship between the Jews of Israel and between the Jews of the diaspora. If it was true, you know, 200 years ago, how much more is it true uh, today? So please, God, um, next Tuesday, we'll all be in Washington, D.C. to rally in support of, uh, of Israel and their brothers and sisters uh, who are there. Um, and then please, God, two weeks from today, we'll be able to pick up with our next Titan of Ashkenaz. I'm going to stop the recording here, but I'm going to stay on and I'm happy to uh, take questions or comments. Wonderful, as always, to have the opportunity to learn with you uh, this evening.